Uh, we received a number of questions and I've tried to group them a little bit according to theme. And so if you're one of our panelists, feel free to turn your camera on and, uh, and we welcome you back into um, uh, back to the floor. Uh, the first question is really about, um, you know, Time. So, uh, or the first theme I would say is time. That is, you know, one one of the early questions was, you know, it's you know, 2023. Um, you know, quite a bit of time has passed um, since you know, since e even conversations around the menthol ban were initially uh, discussed. Um, you know, how are you planning to update your models to reflect more recent contexts? So, you know, obviously there are other things like delays to policy implementation, litigation, things that sort of um, end up costing lives because the time when you sort of are modeling the potential impact is just different. And it's um, and so you end up uh, th like the, the when a policy gets implemented is a bit later than expected. Um, and, you know, of course, context change as well. So policy effects may be different. Um, today than they were at the time when the study was initially conducted. Um, and other things such as COVID-19, um, changing social norms and social environments um, also um, affect the, uh, this, the real world. So I think the first is, you know, how are you making sure that your models are sort of up to date and reflecting some of these changes? And then this, this other piece of the question is, you know, are there um, uh, best practices for how to deal with disruptive things that happen? Um, such as COVID-19 or other phenomena. And that, that's open to all of the mod our modelers on this panel. I'll, I'll try to answer that first. <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, go out on a limb on this. Yeah, I mean, th this, this is, in my view, kind of the toughest issue we face now, and especially in what I am emphasize as a rapidly changing world. Um, now, what's interesting is um, two of the investigators in our T cores are using a technique uses, uh, known as machine learning. And that provides a way of kind of getting the essentials out of the data. And I think it could be very useful in trying to look at how those essentials change over time, how how a model will evolve. And I, I, I mean, is that the best way to do it? Who knows? But, it, you know, it's, it's an attempt. And it's the kind of thing we really need to do if we want people to believe our, our models. Any other reactions? I would build on on what David said by saying that in general, I think part of the value added of modeling of any sort is to help you understand which data is most important to have. Um, and ideally, what we do is we collect new data to reflect changed circumstances. But if we can't collect all the data because it's expensive, we need to know which data is most important um, to collect. And models can provide one kind of answer to that. Uh, and that can help us update quickly. Um, and then, um, so one thing that I'm, I mean, I'm dealing with the data now a lot uh, because of uh, like I'm leading the data core in the Castor. And then the, as the, uh, the more I work with the data is that I feel like it's a really important having that the data in a shape that actually uh, validated for the modeling. So, uh, and then as you mentioned that uh, having like some changes, uh, like disruptive changes, is very, very challenging actually to get the um, data, like it's uh, gonna be in the right shape actually for the modeling. But uh, what we have to do is like, we just, we just do our best. And then one beauty of modeling is that basically, you can actually try the different scenarios and different things, right? So you can actually make some kind of assumption, like what if actually um, this make these changes? Then we can we can actually simulate those those scenarios, but of course, like uh, that can be validated later actually <laughs> when we have actual data <laughs> on that. But in advance, we can actually try the multiple different uh, scenarios on making some sort of kind of assumption. I think that's the one of the beauty of the modeling. Um, but yeah. Um, I think one um, question from Scott Leishow here, um, kind of relating back to social norms, is there a way to incorporate into your models the changing environment 
For example, there seems to be increasing social pushback regarding government intrusion and following rules, et cetera. And I think, you know, I, I guess I could speak more anecdotally that, you know, culturally we were very different than we were in, you know, 2019 um, or 2018. Um, and, you know, we have these models that are allowing us to kind of look backwards, but when we, we were looking forward and we're looking forward in a world where people are thinking about themselves and their behaviors and policies very differently than they were before. Um, and I don't know if that's something that that's captured by models. Um, I think it depends what kinds of policies you're talking about. Um, I think the policies that Tobacco Town mostly focus on that I talked about in my talk are things like zoning and licensing, which are the purview of city governments. And I don't, I'm not sure that attitudes about should cities be allowed to make zoning rules have changed. I've never seen evidence of that, but mm. it could be, could be the case. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. So our next set of questions deals with expert elicitation. So they're a little bit, um, I guess, David could speak to that, but I suspect that um, that others here can also speak to expert elicitation. Um, so one question is, you know, uh, came from Chad Aitken, you know, these experts, similar to the FDA advisory committee for, with drug approvals, did you have a customer advocacy representative as a member of the expert committee? And a, a related question that comes from me, um, you know, with expert elicitation, how can you ensure, you know, a, like fair and unbiased assessments of the literature? Um, or is it that you want the composition of the expert panel to be uh, diverse or balanced enough so that like true objectivity is not so relevant that you, you expect a baseline subjectivity going into it? And is it, you know, if you have a good mix, does that help you to get a more sort of fair assessment um, with these expert elicitations. So yeah, both about like, you know, who gets to like, who, what, what kinds of representatives are on these ex, um, expert elicitation panels and then how to ensure that um, their assessments are fair and uh, relatively objective. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just say, it seems like we debated these issues for years and years and years. <laughs> Uh, but no, the, 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 you know, what's great about expert elicitations is it forces you to ask those questions, you know, and, 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 you know, as you brought up, you, you, I think you asked, uh, do you, do we have like a, a stakeholder for consumer affairs? Um, no, but we needed one. We talked about that and we talked about even the importance of actually, including users. But, you know, when you, you know, that brought up all kinds of questions. You know, users know what they're doing, but they don't think in kind of the terms that we think of when we do the modeling. So, you know, what's the answer here? I don't know. <laughs> but, but it sure was fun trying to figure it out. <laughs> Fair enough. Other reactions on expert elicitation processes? Not. I mean, um, I'm not an expert on this field, but I have seen that David <laughs> has been struggling a lot <laughs> with that. So it's certainly very difficult, uh, although it's a very uh, great resource. I mean, when we had, we don't have like data. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the next sort of set of questions, um, I, I think, uh, deal with, uh, the, with, with tobacco town, town. So, um, and the questions come from me, um, and my questions deal with, you know, how you, um, you know, at, at what point, you, you, like you talked about towards the end of your presentation, you know, custom, like very customized models for different settings. Um, but at what point in your application of the tobacco down or other ABMs is real world sort of context specific modeling still adding value? That is, are there enough findings and lessons learned from the sort of prototypical towns and from, you know, other um, applications that such as those results are generalizable enough that you don't need to have such context specific information? Um 
I think some of the results are generalizable, but I think part of the reason to do an agent-based model is because context matters. Um, so, you know, if, if it was the case that there was a single right answer for every city in America, then you wouldn't really need a model um, at that point. And what we've seen is that that's unlikely to be the case. Um, that said, because we're making specific, uh, parameterizing specific versions of the model for specific real world places doesn't mean that the, we won't learn generalizable things because it could turn out that there are systematic similarities in what kinds of answers work best in certain kinds of cities. And we might learn that better by actually having lots of detailed examples than by having these more generic examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hence the big, the 31 big cities. Um, 30, yep. Mm -hmm. 30, yep. 30 big cities. And I guess a related question is how you, you know, gather and combine the sheer volume of, you know, real world spatial data um, that's necessary for doing that. I, I assume that if you're getting information from different places that it's, um, I mean, that's a sort of data cleaning and <laughs> um, a lot of work. Yeah, data gathering challenge. So, I mean, just the, just the, the, the amount of data that, um, that you need to sort through. How, how are you? Uh, strategizing around that? Well, I mean, we've been working at it for a number of years. It's not something you can do overnight, um, and it is challenging, and the computational loads are challenging. But we've we've been able to have some breakthroughs in sort of data shortcuts that uh, in how we store the data so that it's efficient. Um, and we are able to leverage a, a pretty big investment that NIH already made in uh, in these pop synthetic populations uh, that are actually originally for infectious disease modeling, um, but also can be used in the way that we're using them. Um, and we haven't actually published any of the work that's that data intensive yet, but we will be this coming year, so stay tuned. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think an another question from um, Kevin Karen. How has Tobacco Town been compared to real world consumer behavior? And how did it perform? Uh, so how well did it end up modeling consumer behavior? Or is this coming later when you use the GIS data? Um, some of both. So uh, there were early, earlier versions of existing previous versions of Tobacco Town have tested outcomes like sales volume distributions across retailers or purchase volume distributions across individuals against data. Um, and through the Aspire Center, we've actually been able to collect survey information about actual consumer behavior, which basically didn't exist before we started doing Tobacco Town. Um, to return to my earlier point that models actually told us what data we needed, when the data wasn't there, we actually went out and collected it in many cases. Uh, and uh, so we've done some rounds of that, but our ability to do that is obviously improved by being being able to introduce more spatial and demographic realism, which is what we're doing now. Um, so there'll be some additional rounds of uh, investigation into that. In one of the early versions of Tobacco Town, we actually compared multiple different um, uh, individual decision rules uh, that our agents might be following um, and saw what difference they made in the results and how those results did or didn't compare to data. Great, thank you. Um, I guess, uh, speaking of the potential contributions of um, models to how we think about data that's missing or data that we need, you know, uh, D David, in your model, um, you found that, of course, cessation um, and switching parameters were the driving, you know, those were the most influential parameters. And so other parameters like the relative harm of e-cigarettes compared to cigarettes or the cigarette and, and, and e-cig e um, initiation, those were parameters that were less important. Um, but so far, you know, real world decision making seems to have hinged on uh, both of those less important parameters, right? Um, that is hinged on ENDS initiation and also hinged on um, people's fears about the relative harms of e-cigarettes compared to cigarettes. So this is sort of like, uh, I guess, um, within the general public, and I would say even within the field of public health and tobacco control, this fear of the unknown. But I think what your model is showing is that maybe the unknown is not as scary as the known in some ways. So how do you see models potentially affecting the psychology around public health decision making and how and what things are scary and, and, and worth avoiding and what things are, um, even if we don't know the answer, are not so bad after all? 
Ooh, that, that last question is a real toughie. So l l let me try <laughs> to kind of uh, formulate how I think about it. I, th I think that cessation and switching are so important because they happen immediately. You know, in other words, there th that you see effects on smokers, and in particular, you see effects on older smokers, and they're the people who are going to die in the next uh, ten or twenty years. Yeah, you know, whereas initiation is is much further off, so you could kind of uh, avoid. <laughs> you know, and, and this is the scary thing I think about it that policymakers can avoid thinking about those issues because they don't have to face them immediately. So I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that's kind of, you know, the way I, 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 I my, my off the cuff kind of answer thinking about how, how that might all play out. I guess if we're going to move on to some of the questions about the cigar models. Um, we have a um, a couple of questions about you know modeling, um, you know uh, like uh, I guess Ann Hartman asked about uh, Juhan's second simulation model looking at flavored cigar ban impact on cigarettes and cigars. Doesn't does the ban include um, I, I guess on menthol? Does it include menthol cigarettes? And so I guess the broader question, and perhaps Brian, you can speak on this too. How do you consider in your analyses? On flavored cigars, and um, you know, in relation to the potential for a simultaneous ban on menthol in cigarettes, as in some folks who might discontinue using cigars, it's because they're switching over to cigarettes. So, Jihan or or Brian, if you want to speak to that. So um, I have to say that uh, the second model that the, I just presented was not really. Um, <laughs> We haven't really developed to uh, the in details yet, so there was a really like conceptual uh, framework that uh, we are going to use to develop this model. So, but that's a really great question. Uh, we are going to look at the both flavored in the cigarettes and mentor cigarettes, and also the flavored cigars, and of course, like the switching like between the product that could be uh, the one the data that we have to actually put uh, into the data so, uh, into the model. So. Um, um, I mean, I'm sorry that I don't have like a clear uh, answer to that question yet, <laughs> but we'll certainly yeah um, think about like how to incorporate those uh, into the model. Yeah, I would agree. We didn't, you know, we only looked at uh, the flavor restriction, but I, I think it gets challenging in that the combinations can start to multiply um, when you have multiple um, product standards. Um, but I, I think it should be feasible. I, just, I don't know if this is related, um, but you know, why is there this bimodal distribution for cigar initiation? I think you showed that in your slides, Jun. But is there a reason to believe that sort of initiation patterns with cigars are uh, reflect differ so much? From cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was very interesting pattern we uh, we thought. I mean, in the beginning, like I thought maybe something was wrong in the model, in the analysis, because we haven't seen such pattern in the cigarette, uh, cigarette initiation before. So, but again, that the TOCPS data, um, the 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 reuse uh, cigar cigar use was the, really the mix of the experimental and regular use. So it's a little hard to actually uh, to tease out what caused that the second peak uh, in the initiation. And we are currently uh, yeah examining that the, what caused that the second peak. And I don't have the clear actually uh, idea yet. But that was very interesting pattern that we found from this analysis. Um, Brian, do you know anything more about this? Um, I would have to look at look at it specifically. I mean, I guess maybe some related in what I noted is there seems to be sort of disparate trends for sort of youth use and presumably initiate or experimentation, mm -hmm. and then sort of the more established adult use. So you may have like to some extent sort of two overlapping groups, mm -hmm. um, and that may explain why. Uh, you're seeing somewhat different results at different times. Ten minutes. Thank you. Um, 
I think I ha we have another question that might be dealing again with potential for policy interaction. Um, and I think it's uh, it's directed to, to David, but I think others could, of course, chime in, you know. Um, and, and this, Robert Torch is asking, among the scenarios, for example, a ban on menthol and cigarettes only, a ban on menthol and cigarettes and cigars, a ban on menthol cigs and, and e-cig flavor restrictions, um, what about something that accounts for nicotine levels, right? So why isn't there why isn't there yet a scenario that looks at the possibility of a ban um, that really only affects high nicotine menthol cigarettes and possibly cigars, but that the FDA allows for um, non-addictive or very low nicotine um, menthol combustible products or or um, flavored cigars? Um, I'm not sure if uh, I don't know. If Anyone here feels equipped to answer this question about, um, you know, uh, product regulations that would affect nicotine levels in addition to flavors? Let, let me just say, you know, the, the last question that was posed to me was difficult. This was even more difficult. You, you know, I mean, you, you, you're dealing, you, you know, menthol bans, you know, th there's tremendous uncertainty about that. Nicotine standards is a whole nother level. You know, it, it, you know that's just something that, you know, I think we're kind of thinking about. And, uh, you know, the paper by Appleberg really set the tone for that and how to think about that. And, and uh, but, but he, he, you know, they did an expert elicitation just on that. Trying to think about how that might be combined with menthol is, I, I, I can't even imagine it. That makes my head explode. <laughs> yeah, I guess it also kind of comes back to this earlier question of like keeping your models, um, uh, I guess, updated to reflect the changing environment as well. Because, um, you know, 2018, a lot of things have happened with respect to e since then as well. <laughs> 